Good morning, everyone. I'm O'Shea Jeffson with the Executive Council Office and the moderator for today's COVID-19 update for Thursday, January 27th. Today, we're joined by the Yukon's Acting Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Catherine Elliott, and Yukon Pediatrician and President of the Canadian Medical Association, Dr. Catherine Smart. Closed captioning is provided by National Closed Captioning, and thank you to Mary Thiessen for providing our ASL interpretation today. Following the remarks from our speakers, we'll go to the media on the phone lines for a round of questions, and we'll call you by name. Before we begin, I'd like to verify that everyone can hear us. If any other reporters are having any problems, please email ecoinfo at yukon.ca. I'll now pass it on to Dr. Elliott. Thank you so much. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be speaking here on the traditional territory of the Kwan First Nation and the Ta'an Kwachun Council on this beautiful day uh, here in Yukon. And I'm very pleased to be joined by Dr. Catherine Smart, who's a longtime colleague of mine and a very knowledgeable and experienced pediatrician, as well as the head of the Canadian Medical Association. I also wanted to acknowledge uh, some of the sad news that we've had as a nation uh, over the past couple of days, and that's the finding of uh, what looks to be um, nearly 100 new children in Williams Lake who didn't make their way home from residential school. And I, I want to acknowledge the loss that we have in our country uh, because of the loss of these children. Um, my hearts go out to all those people suffering uh, due to this, and uh, I hope you reach out for help uh, when you need it. I'll start by talking about what's happening with COVID-19 around the territory today. Today, there's one person in hospital with COVID-19. We have 32 new confirmed Yukon residents who have COVID-19, and the previous seven-day average of new cases is 34. There are 209 active cases, and 3,038 total confirmed Yukon residents have contracted COVID since the beginning of the pandemic, with 2,852 of those recovered um, since the beginning of the pandemic. We have already lost 16 people due to COVID-19 uh, since the pandemic touched our shores two years ago. And 120 people have been hospitalized among Yukon residents since the beginning of the pandemic. The percent positivity for the three-day average is currently 38%. I also want to note that Copper Ridge Place and Whistle Bend Place are two long-term care homes where we have outbreak protocols active at this time. And I can speak more about this during the question and answer. Today is an, a very exciting day in Cross Canada. It's National Kids and Vaccines Day and this year, of course, the focus is on COVID-19 vaccines. We are so lucky in this country to be able to have access to um, government covered and safe vaccines for this disease that has swept the globe. And I know Dr. Smart will tell us a lot about this exciting initiative and what's going on today. So I'll keep my remarks brief and I'll focus on the National Advisory Committee on Immunization and their recent recommendations. I was very pleased when, the, when NACI released its most recent report on COVID-19 vaccinations for children aged 5 to 11. As we know, they had released a report in the past which recommended that uh, children may get a vaccine for COVID-19 given the safety profiles that they'd seen in the trials and the safety profiles in adults, as well as the effectiveness of the vaccine at preventing disease and severe illness and death. Uh, Based on the recent findings, with, with many more millions of children who have received this vaccine, NACI has now strengthened their recommendations. They are now recommending that children should receive a vaccine. And that one little word means a lot in the scientific community. It, it speaks to the safety of this vaccine and its effectiveness. And it is a great move ahead to know that we have such a wonderful vaccine. I also want to add that NACI now recommends a third dose of the Pfizer vaccine for children in this age group who are moderately to severely immunocompromised. And if you think that uh, you have a child or you are somebody who might fall into that category, uh, please reach out to the, um, 
to, to go online to see the category or reach out to your healthcare provider to help you uh, determine whether you are in that category. For children eligible for that third dose, the recommended interval is four to eight weeks after the second vaccine. At this time, a booster is not recommended for the average child in this cohort. And I know, although our children haven't reached that four to eight weeks after uh, their second vaccine, I think it's good to plan ahead and know what's coming. There are, however, of course, many 12 to 17 year olds in the territory who have reached their six months since their second vaccine. And many parents are wondering whether that vaccine will be made available. I know that NASI is studying the issue right now and looking at it, and I expect some recommendations in the near future, uh, looking at how best to use uh, a booster dose in these youth and whether it is necessary at this time. We must remember that children are at very low risk for severe outcomes for COVID-19, and even that is true with the Omicron variant. Nonetheless, many of us have been touched by having children in our lives who have become infected and uh, because of the spread that we're experiencing right now in Yukon. There have not been any children uh, who have been hospitalized in Yukon for the Omicron variant. And one might wonder, well, why is this important here? Well, if we look across the country with the number of children who are infected, more children are, are um, being hospitalized and requiring care, and more children have died in this Omicron wave than any previous wave. I hope that doesn't happen here, but this is one, I want you to know that this is one way to protect our children. The other thing is that many children have loved ones around them, and those loved ones uh, are in those categories of people who are more at risk of severe disease. And this is another reason why children uh, should be vaccinated. When updating their recommendations, NASI reviewed the available evidence on the Omicron variant, new and reassuring real world data on the use of the Pfizer vaccine in children and the current evidence on the use of mRNAs in those who are immunocompromised. I know Dr. Smart will speak more to this, so I will leave my remarks on that here. I do encourage Yukoners to check out the summary themselves at canada.ca slash public dash health. <clears throat> The bottom line is that COVID-19 vaccines approved in Canada are safe and effective, and they save lives. The greater the number of Yukoners who are fully vaccinated, the less chance there is of Yukoners becoming infected, developing severe illness, and requiring hospitalization. Our healthcare team has now coordinated and delivered over 90,000 vaccines here in the territory. That is a huge milestone, and we need to keep going. If you need information on vaccine safety, please reach out. <clears throat> you may call your healthcare center or you, might, you could look online at yukon.ca. We're so pleased that about 55% of Yukon's children aged five to 11 have received a first dose. If you want to be uh, in, that, in that group, you can book an appointment for children online at yukon.ca slash this is your shot. For those people in Whitehorse who would prefer to phone, you can call 1-877-374-0425. There is also a list of clinics available online. If you don't see, and if you don't see a clinic time listed in your community, be sure, rest assured that these will be held in the, in the coming weeks. Residents in rural communities can also book an appointment by calling the local health care center. This is a very flexible and responsive vaccine program that will help you get the appointment that you need. Let's get our vax rates up here in Yukon so we can protect the whole family. And by protecting our little ones, let's help keep our elders and seniors, communities, and those who are unvaccinated safe. Before I turn to Dr. Smart, I wanted to remind everyone about at-home rapid testing availability. These tests are being made available to staff and students at schools and early learning programs throughout Yukon. For people in Whitehorse, <clears throat> you should know that there are two ways to get a test. If you have a family member who's part of a school or early learning program, that program will provide information directly to parents and caregivers about when and how to pick up a test. 
For those people who are experiencing symptoms who are in Whitehorse, you can pick up a rapid test kit from the drive through distribution available at the Takini Arena, Monday to Friday from 7.30 a.m. to 3 p.m. In the communities, you can visit yukon.ca for a list of the places and times to pick up the at-home rapid test. These tests should be used when you're symptomatic and are not meant for asymptomatic testing. We do ask that you pick them up when you don't have symptoms um, or someone who doesn't have symptoms picks them up or you follow the safety protocols when you go to pick up your test. In closing, thank you again for all you Connors for toughing it through these current situations. We remain in the middle of this wave and I know it's already been a long haul. It's been a long haul for all of us. We have a little ways to go. However, the days continue to get long, longer. And as we make these sacrifices, change our ways in order to keep our communities safe, I'm really very grateful. As I look around the world and around our country, I realize that this is one of the hardest waves that we here in Yukon have had so far. And also that we did not suffer many of the early waves of the pandemic. And so we're not as used to this as many other parts of Canada. I really do hope we can downgrade our um, stringent public health measures in the coming month or two. However, in the meantime, please continue to do your part for Yukon's elders, for seniors, for little ones, and to keep our communities safe. I'll now turn over to Dr. Smart, who will speak more about the safety of, and, um, and uh, about Children's Vaccine Day. Shoni tan, gunol shish, masi cho, and thank you. Merci. Thanks, Dr. Elliott, and I'm very pleased to be back today to speak to you, Connors, about vaccinations and children, which is, of course, for me as one of your local pediatricians, a very important topic, um, something I feel very strongly about, and I want to make sure that you have the best information to make decisions for your children and your family. I just want to start by saying, you know, I, I fully recognize how challenging this time has been for parents, um, and there's a lot of uncertainty. I know people have been concerned about going back to school. School. People have been concerned about their children's safety and that so many things are changing so rapidly with COVID and particularly with this wave of Omicron that it's been very, very stressful. Um, as a parent myself, I think, you know, so often what we're thinking about is how do I make the best health decisions for my children and how do I make sure that they're safe? And that's why I wanted to speak to you today on National Kids Vaccine Day about what you can do in terms of the COVID vaccine for your children. So what we know right now is over 8 million doses of the COVID vaccine have been given in North America to children 5 to 11. And they have been both ex extremely safe with very few adverse events and also very effective. Uh, we're seeing almost a total elimination of hospitalization in children that have been vaccinated. So I think this is very encouraging news. I think most parents, their main concern is, is the vaccine safe? And I think we can clearly say that it is. And also, is it effective? And it's very much showing through this Omicron wave that it is very effective in preventing hospitalizations and severe illness. As Dr. Elliott said, we're very fortunate that COVID in children remains usually not a severe disease. Most children do well. However, some children do end up requiring hospitalization and in even more rare cases, children can be critically ill. And of course, those are the outcomes that we're wanting to prevent and vaccination does that. Why would we want to be taking that risk when we have a safe and effective alternative? And I think that's really the message that we want parents to hear. Right now, across the country, COVID is one of the leading reasons children are being hospitalized with viral illnesses. And this is typical. In the winter, we usually see an uptick in children requiring hospitalization for the many viral illnesses that we're much more used to. Right now, the main virus that we're seeing causing children to need the hospital is COVID. And what's great right now for us is we do have a vaccine. Many of the other viruses that we see typically in the winter, we don't have a vaccine for. So from my perspective as a pediatrician, it's very encouraging that we can have that protection for children five and up. We know that a, in, you know, a lot of parents, I think, are wondering, well, how at risk is my child? 
We know about two thirds of the children who end up needing hospitalization do have other medical conditions that make them more vulnerable to COVID. But it's also quite clear from the data that about one third of children requiring hospitalization do not have underlying medical conditions. So I think really the message is we can't predict which child might be that rare child to have that severe outcome. And again, we can reduce that risk significantly through choosing vaccines. I think the other really good news that we're learning about this vaccine is how effective it is at preventing some of the post-COVID complications. So some of you may have heard of something called multi-inflammatory systems condition, which is really sort of your body having this inflammatory reaction to COVID, and it's causing children to be sick several weeks after having had COVID, even if their disease was asymptomatic or very mild. The conditions called Miss C can be quite serious and it impacts about one in 3,500 children who contract COVID. And the vaccines are also very effective at preventing that outcome, showing over 90% efficacy in preventing that. So that in my view is just another reason to choose vaccination. We're also seeing emerging literature around the effectiveness of vaccines in terms of preventing long COVID. We don't have a lot of data yet in children. We are seeing this in adults, and I suspect that we'll see some benefit there as well. So in my view, again, another positive. As Dr. Elliott touched on, this week we've seen the National Advisory Committee on Immunization upgrade their recommendation around vaccines for children five to 11 from may give the vaccine to should. And as I think she well described, that small change is actually very significant. What it signals is that the benefit is clear, that the vaccination is much safer than not being vaccinated, and that the evidence in terms of safety and effectiveness allow us to feel confident in making a strong recommendation that this should be a routine child vaccination at this point in time. So I think, you know, what I really want people to understand is that the science, I think, right now is very clear. These vaccines are safe, they're effective. Most children, if they have any side effect at all, it's soreness at the site of injection or some fever, both of which can be managed with over-the-counter medications like Tylenol and Advil. Some children will have a bit of fatigue, but your child will then have long-standing protection against COVID. And right now, with just how contagious Omicron is, we know most of us are going to at some point be exposed to it, and we want to have taken those steps to make sure that our families and our children are protected. Some parents may also be a bit concerned about anxiety their child may have around receiving the vaccine. And that, that's a real concern. And I think sometimes that can be a barrier for wanting to have your child vaccinated. So I wanted to share a few strategies um, that I think would be helpful for that. There is a medication called EMLA, E-M-L-A, and it's a topical numbing cream that you can buy over the counter at any local pharmacy. And you can put it on your child's arm just here over the deltoid muscle well, where they'll receive the vaccine about 45 to 60 minutes before their vaccine appointment. And that will numb the skin so that they don't feel the needle. And that can really help for children that have that fear of the feeling of the prick itself. The other thing that can be really helpful is to work with your child around what to expect. Children generally do better when they're empowered to make choices that are theirs to make. So around being vaccinated, you can talk to your child about what they want it to look like. You know, what things do they want to bring to maybe distract them from what's going on? Maybe that's an iPad with a, some music to play or a video on YouTube. Maybe it's a special stuffed animal. That way they're able to set up an environment where they feel safe and comfortable. The days at the vaccine clinic where they're immunizing children, they've created a child-friendly environment to try to make kids feel comfortable as well. So I think you'll find that when you go to the center. The other thing that can be helpful is planning a celebration after to reward your child for having made such an important choice for their own safety and the safety of their family. And that can be something as simple as a fun activity, or maybe it's picking up an ice cream cone or something else your child would like. So often when we frame it positively, show our children that we believe in them, we know they can do it. Uh, our children generally can be very successful and learn that they can do hard things and take that sense of pride. Tonight, uh, as part of Children's Vaccine Day, myself, uh, two other pediatricians, one from Vancouver, one from Ottawa, and an expert in managing needle fear and anxiety from Nova Scotia, will be doing a panel discussion to answer any other questions you might have about the vaccine. That will be taking place at 6 p.m. Yukon time, and if you're interested, you can go to the website, 
www.scienceupfirst and register for the event. Uh, we're going to go into any questions that you may have. We've got a long list of questions that people have supplied ahead of time, and I think uh, you'll find that any hesitancy you might have or questions that might remain will be answered there. So I certainly invite you to, to join. Thank you, and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Elliott and Dr. Smart. We'll now move on to the question and answer session. A reminder to reporters, just remember to mute and unmute yourselves, and if you could just let us know who your question is uh, directed to. We'll start with Luke from CKRW. Hi, this first question is for Dr. Elliott. I know you mentioned uh, you'd talk about this a little bit uh, earlier, but uh, I wonder if you could update us on the situations regarding uh, Copper Ridge Place and uh, Whistle Bend Place. Thank you, Luke. Of course, many of us are concerned about the uh, outbreaks that are happening at this point in Copper Ridge Place and Whistle Bend Place long-term care facilities. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes. Okay, good. Um, so it's, it's natural to be concerned uh, when we have people in long-term care facilities who have uh, contracted COVID. And, uh, and this is because many of these people are older and have other risk factors for severe illness. Um, on, the, on the good side, we've had many months, in fact, a couple of years now, to prepare for uh, the scale of outbreaks we're seeing right now. And in this Omicron wave across the country, the outbreaks in long-term care are more than they've ever been in the past. I also am reassured that 94% uh, of our residents of long-term care have had two doses of vaccine and 79% have, have chosen to have their boosters. This is all very reassuring information. We do have protocols in place at the, at the long-term care facilities. And uh, we have at this time, nine residents in Whistle Bend who are infected and three in, uh, in Copper Ridge Place and we are monitoring them very closely, making sure they have any medical attention that's necessary, and also um, that we are limiting the spread as much as we can at this time. Thank you. Luke, do you have a follow-up? Uh, no, just the one question for me. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to Haley Ritchie, Yukon News. Thank you. I think my question would be um, for... Um, either of the, the doctors today. Um, I guess with the childhood vaccination rates being around 55%, you know, we're pretty comfortable as far as the rest of Canada goes. We're on track. Um, but obviously, it's a lot lower than the adult vaccination rate. I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about why we think that is. Is that vaccine hesitancy? Is it just it hasn't been available long? Like, why are we seeing it um, pretty consistent around 55, 53% after the last few weeks? I can talk about that. Um, so great question. And again, I think really highlights the importance of today and making sure that we're getting good information out to parents about this vaccine for children. Before the vaccine was approved, there was actually quite a lot of polling that was done asking parents about their intentions regarding vaccinating their children in this age group. And what we're seeing now is actually what we were hearing before the vaccine was even rolled out. Um, there was about 50% of people who were really keen right out of the gate were certain they wanted their child vaccinated. And then there was a large group of parents who I think fell into the category of wanting to wait and see. And most of those, those parents expressed that they were just concerned. And their two main concerns were, is this vaccine really necessary? And is it safe? And I think what we know for any of us who are parents, that it's often much easier to make decisions about ourselves than our children, uh, because we just worry more about doing the right thing when it comes to our children's health. So even though many of those parents are themselves vaccinated, they just felt a little bit more uncertain when it came to their children. And that's why I think the timing of, of today is so important, because we have so much more information about this vaccine now than we did even two months ago. You know, we were very confident it would be safe and effective then, but now we have have had over 8 million children immunized and it's very clear the vaccine's incredibly safe and very effective. Um, but what's also clear is with this Omicron wave, it's getting harder and harder for people to avoid exposures to COVID-19. This variant is highly contagious. It's, as we all know, it's spreading rapidly across the country. So the reality is most of us are going to be exposed and develop some immunity, whether it's immunity through vaccination or immunity through exposure to the virus. And, you know, I think my lens always 
always as a pediatrician is about prevention. What things can we do, what decisions can we make as parents that allow us to prevent danger to our children? And I think we can be really confident today to know that this vaccine offers that safe and effective uh, protection against those potentially rare outcomes from COVID. And COVID's not going anywhere. It's going to be with us likely for a long time. Uh, and having your child vaccinated now allows you that protection and allows us to avoid some of those serious complications, being hospitalized, the inflammatory condition, potentially long COVID. Um, so I, I think we can feel just that heightened sense that we know even more than we knew before that this is safe and effective. And I hope that that message gets through to parents and that we can see that number increase. It's gonna allow our kids to get their lives back, to be able to go back to normal. And that's, I think, as for all of us as parents, also a hugely important issue is how do we let kids be kids again? And vaccination is one of the steps in that direction. Thank you, Dr. Smart. Haley, do you have a follow-up? I do, yeah, I had a second question for Dr. Elliott. Um, I was looking at the Yukon Hospitals webpage that's linked from the COVID case count data page. Um, and right now it has uh, inpatient bed availability for white horse as red, so space extremely limited, um, still space in the ICU. I'm wondering, is that red kind of status uh, normal? Is that related at all to COVID-19? Um, I just want to know if that's sort of a valuable page to be watching mm -hmm. um, as we see Omicron cases continue to rise. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things. Uh, I'll, there's actually two pieces to the answer to this question. So um, it's great that UConn Hospital Corps is now putting its status up. And I think that's very useful for all of us. And there are many reasons that a hospital can be um, in the red uh, um, in terms of bed status. Our hospital is a very busy hospital and, and uh, it's always very busy. It's not always in the red, but it's a very busy hospital. At this time, also with two years of the pandemic, some people have been waiting to go to hospital in order to uh, wait until they felt it was a safer time. And sometimes we're seeing people who are um, presenting at hospital late in their condition, uh, whether that's a heart condition or um, uh, you know, sometimes a late diagnosis of cancer uh, and other illness. And, uh, and some of that is also putting pressure on the healthcare system and I really encourage people, even in the Omicron wave, to go to the hospital if you need that acute care, if you need help, um, whether it's for COVID-19 or for any other illness. I think it's very important to seek, uh, seek care when you have a serious condition. Of course, at this time, it's a good idea to not go to the hospital if you have something that can be treated in other ways through a primary health care provider or another clinic uh, or a community health center. Uh, at this point, the hospital status is not in red due to COVID-19, um, but there are, the, uh, there are a number of reasons, as, such as the ones I've expressed, as well as the fact that healthcare workers um, are uh, tired, and many of them, of course, are contracting COVID-19 at this time or isolating due to, um, due to having family members or uh, care, uh, having somebody who they're caring for or um, themselves being exposed. Um, this is not, um, as you can see with one patient in the hospital, this is not a, a reflection of the hospital. This is actually a reflection of the spread of COVID-19 in our community and how it impacts our healthcare workforce. Uh, when we have significant spread, such as we have now, every workforce is, has been impacted. Many working people have seen this in their own workplaces and healthcare workers are not immune from this, uh, from, from being um being affected uh, and so um, luckily most of our healthcare workers in fact uh, in the hospital they're all uh, uh, vaccinated and so therefore their illness will be mild um, and and so that's very reassuring um, however uh, people are also wondering what should we be watching now that the case counts are different um, and uh, and there are many things to watch i think what's really important is um to like to uh to listen to the updates and really get a sense of where we are in the wave. Uh, very early when we started talking about Omicron, we anticipated that it would grow. Uh, we had that period where it um, had a rapid acceleration. And then we also had, uh, we're now in the middle of the Omicron wave and, and we're sitting right in the middle. And you can see that because the case count is very consistent. The percent positivity is very consistent. Um, we see a consistent number of outbreaks at this time. 
And these are all some things that people, if they want to have a sense of what the risk might be at this point, is. Uh, this means that, as Dr. Smart has said, uh, many people will be uh, exposed to COVID-19, including children, and uh, it's really going to be uh, very hard over a child's lifetime to avoid uh, getting ex being exposed. And this is why the vaccine is just so important right now. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now go to Tim Whitehorse Star. Yes, good morning. Um, I think my first question is for uh, Dr. Elliott, but Dr. Smart can chip in as well. Just wondering about, uh, I know you quoted that the national officials are recommending uh, the uh, vaccines to children in this age range, but how great is a consensus? It was perhaps two weeks ago that the Ontario Chief Medical Officer of Health expressed some reservations and a lack of enthusiasm uh, for uh, prompting uh, uh, the vaccines uh, the way that's being done here. So just how good is that uh, scientific consensus at the moment? The scientific consensus about the safety of the vaccine is excellent. Uh, this is a safe and effective vaccine and it's been chosen to, it's been shown time and again to be, to be effective at preventing severe illness, uh, long-term effects of COVID and also um, transmission. So this is really important uh, thing for people to know. Um, I think in science, you know, we always like to question, and I think it's important that we question the evidence. So you'll hear me sometimes in media um, saying, well, this is where we are now, and there's some uncertainty about this. And, and now there's more certainty, and now there's even more. When NASI moves a recommendation from should, from, sorry, from may, to should, that's a significant step indicating that these uh, millions of children who have been vaccinated, the safety profile of this vaccine is excellent. Uh, there's very strong scientific consensus that this vaccine is very effective and safe and is the best choice to keep children healthy. Thank you. Tim, do you have a follow-up? Yes, I do. I was just wondering if any figures are available as to how many children have been hospitalized in the Yukon, uh, especially during the Omicron wave, or is that something you'd mm -hmm. have to look up? Mm -hmm. uh, we have not had any children admitted to hospital during the Omicron wave. Um, to my uh, knowledge at this point, um, if if that's different, I will um, I will correct myself and I'll make sure that you get that information, Tim. There's no children in the hospital right now, and there hasn't been for a few weeks, definitely. Um, we have had uh, uh, many children seen in the emergency department because when children are short of breath, have a prolonged fever, or they're otherwise very unwell, it's, it's important to get them assessed. And I think that's a, that's a good sign if parents are taking their children uh, to the emergency department to be assessed when they're very ill. Uh, if we look across the country, there are um, many children hospitalized at this point. Um, and, uh, and I'm not sure, um, Dr. Smart, if you want to add to that at all. Thank you. Sure. Yes, I definitely can. Um, mm -hmm. I think a few things, you know, as Dr. Elliott said, we're seeing a few things with children across the Canada, absolutely increased visits to emergency departments. What's been different with Omicron is it's acting more like an upper respiratory virus in children, uh, in some ways than previous waves. So a lot of children are actually presenting with croup. Um, which I'm sure most parents have experienced at some point in time, the hoarse voice, barky cough. Um, and that is something that is very uncommon to need to be hospitalized for, although it can be severe. But it's very distressing for children to have croup, and it's very, very scary for parents. So that's been one of the, the things that's been common. Um, there's more children hospitalized now with COVID across Canada than we've seen throughout the pandemic, and that's partly just because the numbers are so much higher because this variant is so contagious. When you look at our statistics throughout the pandemic, about 0.3% of children who have gotten COVID have ended up in hospital. So it is a rare outcome. But again, I think the message that's important for parents is it's uncommon for children to get seriously ill really from any infection. Um, and those are the outcomes that are still worth preventing when we have a safe alternative. You know, I think of it a little bit like wearing my seatbelt, right? You know, I've got two children, 11 and 13. 
They've worn their seatbelt every day. They've been in a car with me. We've never been in a car accident as a family. But I take that precaution because I don't know what might happen next. And I think when we think about prevention in pediatrics, it's really that same lens. That's the reason for routine childhood immunizations. And that's the reason for this COVID-19 vaccine. It's safe, it's effective, and it prevents those rare outcomes that can be avoidable. Um, so I think that's really the important, important message. And again, we just know that with Omicron and so many more people being exposed, it just increases that likelihood of your child being infected. And then there's always that chance that they could either feel really awful, which isn't fun in and of itself, or potentially need the hospital. Thanks, Tim. We'll now go to Claudiane, Radio Canada. Oui, merci. Euh, donc, la question pour Dr. Elliott. J'essaie juste de, de, de comprendre le big picture. Donc, d'une part, vous souhaitez oui. augmenter le taux de vaccination chez les enfants qui se situent en ce moment autour de 50 mais de l'autre, il est difficile d'obtenir des, euh, des euh, rendez-vous pour la vaccination pour les enfants. Et euh, dans les garderies, on n'a pas le mandat pour les, euh, les, les, euh, les employés euh, d'être vaccinés. Donc, on peut présumer que les enfants dans les garderies sont plus sont susceptibles ou plus susceptibles peut-être d'être exposés euh, au virus. Alors, qu'est-ce que vous allez faire? Qu'est-ce que vous allez mettre en place comme action pour réconcilier ces deux aspects-là? So the, doc, uh, the question is for Dr. Elliot. Um, at this point, there seems to be a dichotomy between two possibilities. On one side, you want to increase vaccination uh, with children, uh, but at the same time, it's very difficult to get appointments. And then in daycare, uh, there seems to be uh, another approach to the whole vaccination uh, question. So how uh, are you going to reconcile these two positions and, and what is actually the goal that is aimed for at this point from your office? Thank you for the question, Claudine. Uh, merci pour la question. I think I'll answer it in English first and then French because um, this is going to be a question that a lot of parents are going to be wondering. Um, parents are uh, sometimes wondering why uh, we're promoting the vaccination, but when they log on, there might be five or six different appointment times on a day, and maybe it's, uh, you know, sometime this week. Um, so, uh, you know, it doesn't seem to many people that there's many um, appointments available. I want you to understand a little bit about how we work here in Yukon with vaccines appointments, because it is a little different than how they work in a, in a larger jurisdiction. Um, we have had already an opportunity for every child to have a vaccination who wanted one, and we will continue to have that um, throughout this pandemic and for as long um, as, uh, as I can affect that. Um, so uh, when you log on and you see a certain number of appointments, the first thing to know is that there are, that that is not a single appointment that is a large number of appointments around that time that you book and so um you know say there's a nine o'clock that's 10 or 20 appointments at nine o'clock so this is the first thing to know the second to know is that our vaccine program is very responsive so right now we have two uh, goals that we're meeting. One is to help people get a chance to get their booster appointment, and the other is to get their pediatric vaccine appointment. Every day or two, our vaccine uh, staff look at that demand and they alter the appointments in order to meet the demand that uh, that is there. So, and this is for um, in, in Whitehorse, and I'll speak to communities in a minute. So please don't be afraid that if you don't see a, a large number of appointments, that there aren't appointments, of course there are appointments, of course we want every child vaccinated. And, uh, and, um, and we'll make uh, special arrangements as Dr. Smart spoke to around different things that children need to help them feel comfortable. And we will work with you if you have a child with a severe needle phobia or who's uncomfortable getting vaccinated or anywhere in between. Uh, this is our goal to keep children healthy and safe. Um, so that's, that's for, for Whitehorse, for the communities. Um, we are offering clinics in communities at set times. In addition, uh, the nursing uh, community health centers are communicating regularly with the vaccine team and ensuring that they have appropriate access to vaccines. Sometimes that means that there's a number of children who would like a vaccine and they offer a clinic. Sometimes it means making other arrangements to ensure that children are able to access those vaccines. These are the ways we can work in Yukon. I, I call it, you know, really responsive 
public health, and I've never seen anything like it in the many jurisdictions that I've worked in in the past. The second is uh, people wondering what the goal is. In particular, with the changing uh, way we've approached, we're approaching schools now, um, with the changing ways we're, we're doing our um, investigations in schools, we're moving to that routine surveillance model that is really long-standing public health science here, um, here in Yukon and across Canada and around the world. And this is monitoring signals of disease. We're looking at uh, whether children are absent from school. We are looking at uh, if they're absent, what type of illness are we seeing? because it could be COVID-19, it could also be another illness that's infectious and that we need to uh, help schools and, and people manage. Maybe there's a treatment. Uh, some of our illnesses that we see, um, there are treatments for that we need to, to reach out to people and, and ensure that they have that opportunity to get the treatment if they need it. So this surveillance system that we're using in schools and in, day, and in early learning child centers is a, is a tried and tested um, surveillance tool that we're using. We've also now been able to offer rapid tests. So families will be able to uh, access a rapid test when they don't have symptoms in order to keep it at home so that they can do that test if they do have symptoms. Of course, if it's a positive, that's a COVID-19. If it's a negative, it means the virus was not detected. It still may be present in the child's body and they need, you need to follow that public health advice about isolation and protecting those around you. Our goal is to keep children as healthy as possible. Keeping schools open and early learning child centers open has been shown to be the best thing for children's mental and physical health throughout the pandemic. And this is, Yukon is leading the way in keeping these important health, uh, these important communities going and healthy and really work to support the Department of Education and parents and uh, parent councils, school councils, uh, in order to, to really go through this time. I know it's been hard. I'm a parent myself. I can tell you that, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's hard for children to move from remote learning uh, into in-person learning. But I can also tell you that from my own experience and also from the very vast now scientific literature that in-person learning is the healthiest and best thing for children. Uh, thank you. Now, <laughs> I think Fajen, you would like to answer in French. Um, and I will, um, I'll keep it a little shorter in French, but I will still answer your question. Um, merci pour la question. Uh, il y en a des gens qui, uh, qui, um, qui ont des questions parce que quand ils uh, cherchent un appartement uh, uh, vaccinal en ligne, uh, ils ne voient pas beaucoup d'appartements. C'est parce que um, nous avons uh, un programme qui répond aux, 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 aux besoins de, de société. Si, um, si on voit qu'il uh, y a beaucoup de, de familles uh, qui ont des enfants qui veulent, um, qui veulent, uh, qui veulent leur vacciner, on va avoir encore des vac des, des, uh, plusieurs que le, le minimum uh, um, opportunités pour les gens d'avoir ce vaccin. Si on voit qu'il y a des gens qui veulent leur deuxième ou troisième, les, les adultes, les, les jeunes, on, on va ajuster nos, nos appointements pour ça. Alors, c'est vraiment un une programme responsive. Aussi, il faut savoir que quand il y a un une bouton avec l'heure pour l'appointement, il y a plusieurs appointements à, à ce moment-là. Alors, ce n'est pas juste un, une opportunité pour une famille, c'est pour plusieurs familles. Um, et ça change uh, toujours parce que notre uh, programme uh, change uh, les dates um, au, au, uh, pour ajuster aux besoins des gens. Dans les communautés aussi, uh, on a des cliniques uh, qui sont um, à l'horaire, mais on a aussi des, uh, des opportunités s'il y a beaucoup de, de monde qui veut des, des vaccins um, pédiatriques pour le, les, les enfants. On va... Um, on va uh, assurer qu'il y a des, des opportunités pour ça aussi. Mais uh, peut-être c'est une clinique, peut-être c'est une, uh, une, une visite um, un, à un pour uh, un ou deux enfants, mais on, on a juste pour uh, assurer que les gens ont l'opportunité d'avoir les, les, uh, le vaccin. En même temps, il y a des gens uh, qui, qui ont... Um, je sais que c'est um, uh, difficile, ça, ça provoque... Uh, un peu d'anxiété quand on change euh, 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 le méthode de, de faire euh, euh, contrôler le COVID-19 dans les écoles et dans les, euh, les, euh, 
les, um, pour les enfants qui sont plus petits. Je veux, je veux, je veux vous assurer qu'on comprend l'approche de surveillance, qu'on prend pour um, beaucoup d'autres um, um, maladies infectieuses et qu'on a pris uh, depuis longtemps. Il n'y a, euh, a pas beaucoup de monde qui savait que nous faisons ça. C'est parce que ça marche bien. Et quand il y a un problème, nous le, nous le l'adresse et, et on ne veut pas que ça, euh, que la maladie passe de l'une personne à l'autre. Et, et, euh, et c'est ça qu'on fait euh, avec ce, cette surveillance. On a aussi maintenant les opportunités pour les gens de prendre des, des tests rapides euh, quand euh, les, les écoles et des autres endroits dans les communautés. Um, peuvent uh, donner aux familles um, les, ces tests uh, pour uh, les, les prendre à la maison et puis les utiliser quand les, les enfants sont malades pour voir si peut-être c'est uh, positif. C'est très important de savoir si la test est positive, c'est-à-dire qu'ils uh, ont détecté le, le virus uh, um, dans le corps et il faut poursuivre les... les um, les instructions pour um, isoler, protéger les, les gens um, entre um, qui sont les contacts. Et aussi, si c'est négatif, c'est-à-dire que le virus n'est pas um, détecté dans le corps, peut-être c'est là, mais ce n'est pas dé détecté pour numéroses raisons. Alors, c'est toujours important de uh, um, suivre uh, les, les instructions au site web et surtout de, de rester à la maison um, quand, um, depuis uh, le, le, le nombre de jours est passé et aussi uh, et de ne pas retourner quand on est toujours malade. Pour tous les parents, c'est important de savoir si votre enfant est, um, est très malade, c'est toujours uh, important de leur avoir uh, amené au centre, uh, aux communautés de, de santé ou bien Um, au um, au uh, so, uh, um, phys, um, docteur ou aux autres um, uh, practitioners de, de santé, ou bien uh, si c'est très malade, ou à l'hôpital pour avoir uh, un uh, assessment. Merci. Oh, pardon. C'est toujours très important de, de vous savoir que le, le but, c'est d'avoir um, les écoles et les centres pour les jeunes. Uh, ouvert parce qu'on sait depuis beaucoup de temps dans cette pandémie, euh, il y a beaucoup d'évidence scientifique que c'est très important que les enfants vont euh, avoir leurs leçons en personne. Euh, c'est parce que c'est euh, très important pour leur santé émotionnelle, leur santé intellectuelle et aussi sociale. Et ça, c'est très important, particulièrement dans ce temps-là, quand on a des restrictions. Um, alors, um, ça c'est ce qu'on qu a fait ici au Yukon. Uh, nous, sommes, uh, nous avons fait un, un, um, uh, avoir les écoles ouvertes um, et, et uh, le plus que, um, ou juste uh, en haut uh, que les autres provinces uh, et territoires. Et nous sommes fiers de ça parce que ça c'est très important pour la santé des enfants ici. Merci. Claudiane, as-tu une deuxième question? Non, ça va, merci. We'll now move to Jim Butler, White Horse Star. Yes, good morning, Dr. Elliott. Um, we were wondering, with parents not having to report positive tests to schools, how would you counsel education professionals who are anxious about not knowing the precise number of infections present in the school environment? Thank you so much for that question. I think many people have been following the number of exposure notices, the number of children that they know about in the class or staff members who might be ill, and using this to help them judge whether there's COVID-19 potentially in a school or in a community or in the, in the learning environment or not. I think it, when we're in the middle of a wave like now with the amount of transmission that we're seeing, the potential for exposure is there in in many, many settings, including schools. And this is why we have all the measures in place in order to protect children and staff. Um, I think it's important to know that, you know, that's why we ask children to wash their hands, to wear their masks at all times, even when sitting at their desks, to take them off for eating, wash their hands, eat, wash their hands, put it back on and wash their hands. And that's because these are the types of things that keep people safe. We know that children need that contact, that in-person learning. And so 
Um, these measures are the, the ways that we mitigate that harm. We cannot get it down to zero. And that's why it's important to think about your family, your circumstance. If you have a child, for example, who has um, particular susceptibility to severe disease because of severe immunocompromise or moderate immunocompromise, that's the time to be extra cautious. And, the, and you can work with your school to, to, to talk about what that looks like. Um, and if for your family, it's not a comfortable place and you feel that virtual learning is the best way for your family, this is an option. However, we know that all children benefit from in-person learning and we can see that we have opened the schools and we have done this uh, throughout this wave and we've seen the benefits in children. We've all had to shift and pivot. We've had to move online for a day or two, sometimes a week or two. And then we have to shift back into the classroom. This is not a normal school year for anybody. However, it is the best learning that we can provide in this time. Thank you. Jim, do you have a follow-up? Yes, uh, on a slightly different topic. I'm wondering what uh, information or assurances either doctor can provide to you, Connors, about the Omicron subvariant that is now showing up in Alberta. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we know that viruses change, and this uh, COVID-19 virus has changed time and again throughout this pandemic. Um, some people will recall early in December, uh, we were talking about the Omicron variant that was recognized in late November, and it was recognized as a variant of concern at that time by the WHO. And we started talking about it. And then, uh, you know, I announced the first time that we had a case here. And then I announced we have community transmission of Omicron here. And now we're living with community transmission. Very early, I would I, I let you know that we thought perhaps it was less, uh, the Omicron variant was less severe. However, we weren't sure. Later, I was able to say, we've got good evidence now that this is a less severe, severe variant. Similarly, we could tell that pretty early that it was very transmissible. Again, we weren't sure about the vaccine. Would the vaccine be effective? Now we know that the vaccine is effective against um, infection about 50% of the time, and it's highly effective against hospitalization and severe outcomes. And now we have a new subvariant of, um, of, of the same strain of the Omicron, and we're learning about this variant every day. It has been recognized in Canada. There's 50 odd cases, um, the last uh, update I had. <laughs> and uh, and this, uh, this is something we're going to watch and learn about. Um, we know what, what I can say that this tells us is that COVID-19 will be with us for a very long time. It will morph, it will change. And we also have seen time and again that the vaccines continue to protect. And with each wave that the vaccines still work, they prevent that hospitalization, they prevent that severe outcome and they prevent transmission 50% of the time. So this is what we this is what we do in communicable disease. We watch for new variants, we study them, we learn about them, we use the science, and we use that science then to translate into what should we do here. We have seen time and again that the vaccine is the safest and most important tool that we have in in this combating this uh, pandemic. The vaccine is what the most one of the things that I'm watching when I'm thinking, can we take measures off? I look at the immunity and the population, how many people have been vaccinated, because that will give us a sense of our population risk of people going to hospital or needing that extra care. And, and these are some of the things that we, you know, we learn as we go through. I, I want to, you know, again, put a shout out to National Kids Vaccine Day. I think it's a very important day. And I also want to let you know that this is normal for variants to new variants to arise. Sometimes nothing comes of it. Sometimes it becomes the dominant variant. We shall see as we go together through this pandemic. Thank you. We'll now go to Chris McIntyre, CBC. Good morning. So my uh, question is regarding uh, reporting the results. So there will be about 11,000 tests uh, being sent to communities across the territory, yet parents are still not required to report any of the results. So how can we possibly know accurate numbers if positive rapid tests aren't being included in, in the daily case count? So what can we follow? How can we know accurate numbers if uh, rapid tests aren't being included in the, in the daily case count? Um, this, is a, this, is, this is a great opportunity to talk a bit about surveillance. So um, I'll give you an example. 
it's not the same disease, but it gives you a bit of a sense. We have been through many uh, seasons of influenza. Influenza is a vaccine preventable disease like COVID-19, and it's one that affects certain populations more severely, uh, pregnant women, older people, people with lung and heart conditions. We certainly never count every case of influenza. We don't test every person with an influenza-like illness, and we don't follow the case counts. We've used surveillance. We're now using this tried and tested tool for COVID-19. COVID-19 is not influenza, it is different. And we are doing some things differently. We are using some, some further tools as well as we roll out vaccines, et cetera. We're offering rapid tests and we're offering other tools for, for children and, and people to know whether to return to school or work, et cetera. We no longer uh, do follow every case and we, those case counts therefore are not uh, um, a census. We don't count every person. However, the criteria for, um, for who requires a test is consistent. And if you look at the test, the number of people testing positive, it's actually been incredibly consistent. I, I, I'm very proud of you, Connors, for making this shift in such a consistent way, because we, the, this, the steadiness of those case counts is important. Of course, time and again, I said, I'm looking at hospitalizations and I will continue to look at that. We're looking at um, absentee from schools. We're looking at absentee from work. We're looking also at uh, emergency department visits. We're doing all of these things in order to uh, follow the disease in the population using surveillance, which is a, a tried and tested tool. I think uh, that, that covers it. Uh, I know it's un uncomfortable for many people not to know that the case numbers. However, when we're in the middle of the wave, I think we do need to rest assured that the, the measures we have uh, do protect us from transmission because we, they're, they're, we will all be exposed uh, we will all be uh, in an environment with somebody who's infectious with COVID-19 and whether we're exposed or not has to do with whether we follow the rules and keep our distance, we wash our hands, we wear our mask and, uh, and we keep our contacts small. Thank you. Chris, do you have a follow-up? I do. So what are you seeing in children who contract COVID-19 and who have only had one of their shots? Uh, the second shot is only now becoming available for children 5 to 11 years old. And given the contagiousness of Omicron, has there been any thoughts to reducing the time between shots for that age group? Mm -hmm. um, for example, in the U.S., it's only four weeks versus here where it's eight weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll start. And I, I'd like to ask Dr. Smart to speak to this, too. I think we're so lucky to have Dr. Smart here today, and we should take every opportunity as well uh, to have her weigh in. Um, so to start, we are seeing illness in children who are, uh, have had a single vaccine. Uh, we've seen mild illness here in Yukon. I also want to go back to a previous question and let you know that there have been no children in, in the Omicron wave hospitalized here in Yukon. I did get that confirmed uh, during the media today. Um, we also um, are seeing, um, uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat the second part of the question? Uh, totally. So given the contagiousness of Omicron, uh, has there been any thoughts to reducing the time between the shots yeah. for the age group of 5 to 11? Right. right. So we asked parents to wait uh, eight weeks between the first shot and the second shot. And uh, I want you to also be reassured that when NACI uh, revised the pediatric updates for uh, updated the guidance for children and vaccine, that they also reviewed that is in this time of Omicron, eight weeks still advisable between the first shot and the second shot for children? The answer was yes. And here's why. When you get that first shot, you, your, your immune system gets a little smarter. It recognizes uh, certain parts of the spike protein and it's able to then, if you get infected, respond to that. You have a pretty good response. If you get that second shot very close, your immune system doesn't have the time to build up the deep T cell memory, that memory that lasts a long time. And when we're vaccinating children right now, we want them to be protected now. We also want them to be protected for the long term. And so waiting that eight weeks just gives that time for the immune system to learn deeply about um, COVID-19 and be able to recognize it uh, when it sees it again. The second shot is because the immune system has put that deep into the, to the body, into the bones, into the immune system. And that second shot is a, what we call um, 
a, a part of that primary series in order to ensure that that second shot uh, can give the, the immune system what it needs in order to have that long duration of immunity. Eight weeks is still the right uh, time between dose one and dose two. And I'd like to turn it over to Catherine Smart to, um, to give a little more detail on that. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. And that's been a really common question um, from parents, for sure. You know, what's the best thing to do? Um, and as Dr. Elliott said, the main reason behind NASI's recommendation for the eight-week interval was they felt that the other information and research we have on vaccines and children show a more durable immune response with that longer interval. Um, the other reason that they chose the longer interval at the beginning was because of myocarditis as a complication we were seeing a vaccination in kids 12 to 18. And there was some suggestion that the shorter interval made that more likely as a complication. So of course, when we're looking at vaccines in children, the most important thing always is safety. Um, so that was NASI felt that perhaps that longer interval would also make that adverse effect less likely. What we've seen, um, which I think is very encouraging and is sort of what we expected, was in the United States where they have used the shorter interval, myocarditis in kids 5 to 11 has still been very rare. With almost 9 million doses given, there's only been 12 cases of myocarditis in that age group, and they were all mild and self-resolving. We thought that would likely be the case just because myocarditis is much more uncommon in that age group to begin with, so we expected that. We expect our numbers will likely even be less than that in Canada because we are using the extended interval. So I think there's sort of a couple things here. There may, I absolutely agree that I think for the vast majority of children, the eight week interval makes sense. You may be a family with a specific situation where your child has a medical vulnerability or underlying medical condition where you, your risk is higher. And in your situation, the shorter interval may make sense. And there may be families that have already done that. And that was a, a safe decision. And that, there's no problem with having done that and, and made that choice. Your child will still be well protected. But for the vast majority of children, we expect we're going to see a longer and more durable uh, response with the eight weeks and that's why that has remained the recommendation. We do still see some protection against hospitalization and severe disease with the single dose of vaccine uh, so that's also been encouraging. Thank you and I'll go to Nick at the Canadian Press. Uh, no thanks but my uh, question has been answered. Thank you and that concludes our event for today. Thanks to Dr. Elliott and Dr. Smart for their time. And thank you also to the media and everyone who tuned in to watch live over Facebook. Stay safe, stay kind, and have a wonderful Thursday, everyone.